now we're beginning and we're going to talk about your origins. When were you born? Where were you born? And why did you come here? Okay. Start off with I was born in 1923 in Berlin, Germany. And uh, about 1925, my father uh, immigrated to the United States and uh, eventually divorced my mother. I grew up and went to school in Berlin. I studied in Berlin until it was uh, kind of interrupted during World War II where I was drafted in the Air Force. And uh, among other things, I uh, flew as flight engineer on night fighters. So then after the end of the war, there was nothing for an aeronautical engineer to do in Germany because we were not allowed to build aircraft or anything of that nature. So I took a putt shot and thought maybe my father was still alive and well, who had become in between an American citizen. And uh, last known address, I was lucky he lived in St. Louis, and I made contact with him. So a couple letters back and forth, so eventually in 49, I was able to get a visa to leave Germany and come over to St. Louis, where I right off hand started to look for a job. Now, my dad had actually spoken with Mr. McDonald, who used to run McDonald Aircraft, who used to own McDonald Aircraft in St. Louis. And he said, oh yeah, we can always use a good aeronautical engineer. So I went for an interview, but then it turned out that the Navy turned it down because uh, legally in 49, the United States were still at war with Germany. Plus there was uh, classified material and I couldn't get any classification. So, uh, I had to find some other jobs, so applying for all kinds of jobs, I eventually wound up as a truck mechanic. So I worked a couple of years as a truck mechanic, and then uh, I got permission from a congressman to uh, make licenses for aircraft and engine mechanics and instructors' ratings. So I made those ratings and uh, worked then for Ozark Airlines. That was the beginning of Ozark Airlines, as a matter of fact. Then we started out to, uh, with five old DC-3s to fly out of St. Louis. But it was very interesting. I became the ground instructor. And then in uh, 1955, I became a citizen. And within three months, I was employed at McDonald. So needless to say, I got back into engineering again. And after working on some military projects, I heard the rumor there was a civilian project called Project Mercury. So uh, by that time I was pretty tired of military <laughs> things anyhow. So I found out uh, who was running the program and so on and what they needed. So then I sold myself to them that they just had to have me in the program. And uh, lucky for me I was accepted and then started out in the Mercury program. That was also the time when we planned Mercury that uh, I became very well acquainted with the Van Braun team because the first flight we were going to make was a Mercury Redstone, Redstone being built by the Army Arsenal in Huntsville. And uh, we made rather frequent trips to Huntsville to coordinate and uh, eventually Dr. Van Braun and myself became pretty good friends. So in 1958, I came down to Cape Canaveral for a different program first on a little missile type job. And then I was asked if I would like to move down here for Mercury. So with four other people, we opened the McDonald operations in Cocoa Beach. And that was quite an adventure to uh, be here in uh, 59. As a matter of fact, there wasn't much to be had. We had a two lane road going to the Cape and if you wanted to make a 7 o'clock starting time, you better be by 5 o'clock on the road because it was bumper to bumper traffic. And uh, we had the old Polaris Motel, that's when you stopped in the morning. And from then on, you could just about walk faster than you could drive. But uh, these were the beginning days and uh, there wasn't much to be had. We had the, the greatest attraction was the Starlight Motel, which had a fantastic uh, bar there that uh, showed some of these uh, pictures that you light up, you know, with black lights and so on. It eventually burned down. But uh, for the first months we all stayed in motels and then later on uh, I rented a house on Merritt Island 
and eventually bought the house I'm living in now. But uh, in these old days it was great. We could drive on the beach. You didn't see many people. You could fish from the beach and all this. So that was a pretty good time. We had, except there wasn't much in the line of entertainment. We had one old movie house called the Barn Theater. And uh, if you wanted some live entertainment, the best thing you could have was on Friday nights, they had next to the barn a little store that uh, held weekly auctions. And this was a place where really they were selling snake oil and whatever you can envision, they were selling at the auction. It was really good entertainment. It was also educational because what frequently was auctions off were furniture and so on from Air Force personnel that were transferred. And you could study things and interesting enough, the items that went for the highest price were always kitchen sets because women would get in love with a certain kitchen set and bid higher than they could buy it from Sears and Roebuck out of the catalog. So it was uh, really a uh, interesting world there and it was our one and only entertainment really we had unless we wanted to go to Orlando which was quite a bit away from us. So needless to say we also what they called the good old days were good old long hours. 12 and 14 hour days were not uncommon and you had to frequently just make do with things that you had. For instance, I remember one time we were running on Mercury on Redstone Pad and was already 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock at night and we had about another hour's worth of tests to run and it became decision time. If we shut down, it takes us two hours to power down, then send the people out, we lose another two hours for them to come back and then two hours to power up. So uh, I sent out a trial balloon and thought uh, maybe all the engineers and our technicians would be willing to stay if we get them some sandwich and some coffee. So they agreed to do that. So I called uh, at that time Bernard Sof and they sent me 100 ham and cheese sandwiches and two ounces of coffee to the south gate. And we picked it up and uh, we actually saved a lot of time by just keep on, keeping on going. And at that time it was also very easy to do because the company gave us a free hand but otherwise I could pay for the ham sandwich with petty cash. So these were the early beginnings when we had uh, time at a premium. As a matter of fact it got so bad that uh, Dr. Debus installed some foldable beds in a building right next to the blockhouse. So they were when it wasn't time, you know, you had sometimes you got off at eight, nine o'clock and had to be back in at five and you figured it takes you two hours to get home. It was uh, much easier to just stay there and sleep. Except these beds had a nasty habit. If you rolled towards the wall, that's where they were hinged and the spring would fold you up right into the wall. In the middle of the night you would wake up, you say, you know what happened to me? I mean, I'm help, you know, I'm completely in a box. But uh, it was better than, you know, not sleeping at all. So these were the uh, early days when we uh, spent what we call now the good old days, but, but actually were really long hours. I mean, 80 hour weeks were not uncommon for us, seven days a week. And you couldn't tell your family what you were doing? Or? No, with us we were able to tell them pretty much what we were doing since we were not a classified program. But it was at that time still where everything at the Cape was classified. And uh, if you recall the early 60s and so on, I think the average was three out of five missiles launch used to blow up. So people would go out and uh, get all kinds of schemes on, to find out when would be launched. And uh, I remember one thing was easy, right at the Port Canaveral they had a camera station. And frequently we would go out and watch out when he opens the shutter on the front, we said, aha, now it goes. And then just to be scrubbed again and try again. But with uh, Mercury and so on, this was pretty open because uh, like it was a civilian program and uh, we could tell them pretty much what we were doing. So these were the old days when we, when we were trying to get to Mercury and Germany off the pads. You met the astronauts, you 
became friends with them, I suppose. Oh yeah, I, I had very close contact with all of them because, see, I was in charge of the uh, preparation of the spacecraft itself. So, uh, the way my job description actually read that any and all activity in and around the spacecraft and its attending GSE had to go through me. And I worked through established channels, you know, to get the work done. But I, I would interface with the engineers and the supervisors and the inspectors. But uh, essentially, uh, I pretty much controlled what we used to call the white room. This is when uh, John Glenn eventually, as you can see one of the pictures on the wall there, he hung a title on me. He said, uh, you're the Pat Führer because uh, you kind of run it like a dictator. Now, I always told him it's not really the case. I mean, it's pretty much a democracy. Do what I tell you, I get off the pad. And uh, that became pretty much later on a, a story when uh, Pete Conrad, he uh, was asked once by Neil Armstrong, he says, uh, how do you get along with this guy, you know? And uh, Pete says, oh, he's simple, just do what he tells you. Uh, Arm, uh, Armstrong says, oh, what can he do if I throw a switch whenever I want to? He says, oh, nothing, he steps on your fingers. It wasn't that bad. But we used to have many, many stories, you know, that uh, we uh, worked together because uh, I would hear what they complain about, and what could be changed, and what should be changed, and so on. And needless to say, I mean, getting everything ready. At that time, a Mercury spacecraft was not the most comfortable thing to be in. Even they had couches which were molded to their own body but for four or five hours laying on your back with your legs up high, you know, that was not the greatest thing in the world. So, uh, also what happened is that uh, it started to be picked up rather frequently with the press to get to the astronauts, interviews, interviews, so when they wanted to get away from things, they would uh, just disappear and come over to my house, where I spent at that time I had built this room here in here right now, and uh, they could do whatever they wanted to. Uh, either they were at my house or there was another fellow down the road, Jim Bishop. And uh, we were the two people that made astronauts or their families disappear. Because it can get pretty hairy when you have a whole group of reporters, nothing to do but trying to get an exclusive interview or find out something the other guys don't know. So uh, frequently we are just to protect the families from the onslaught of reporters. There's a lot of serious work going on, but I guess there was some humor at the same time. Yeah, what happened is, you know, when you work these long hours, uh, after a while you realize, unless you can laugh at yourself once in a while, you're going to go off on the deep end. Because uh, the responsibilities are such that uh, you make a mistake and you blow yourself to pieces. So, especially where I was, uh, when we were putting the uh, flight crews in, there was nobody around for three and a half miles, like in Apollo, except the, uh, my group, you know, and then the astronauts. So, needless to say, I spent many, many a night just thinking, what can happen and how can I prevent it from happening? So, uh, we found a way to... Uh, relax ever once in a while by playing what we call what Wally Shiro really came up with, a gotcha. And a gotcha was something you did to your fellow worker or astronaut, but it had to be something that hadn't been done before. It had to be unique. And uh, went to quite some great extents to uh, things that happened to us, let me tell you. Luckily, we were, at that time, it was pretty neat uh, because very few of these stories hit the newspapers, so they respected our privacy there. That and we normally weren't talking about it anyhow, but it was the typical guy, just you know, just to give an indication of how we went. Pete Conrad one night, I mean, when we came out of the trainer, he went ahead and outside the training building he found a four foot black snake. So he broke in my desk, sent a drawer, and stuck it in. And the next morning there were six of these guys standing around just waiting to see what happened when I opened my center drawer. So, needless to say, when I opened the center door, there was a real mad black snake, and I backed up and tore the telephone right out of the wall, you know, and they said, uh-huh, gotcha. But it is, you know, see, you always get evens, and so 
So when he ran to an interview, uh, a TV interview on camera at the headquarters building when he was late, so he jumped in front of the cameras putting his coat on. That's when he found out I had the sleeve sewn shut. So see, this is how you get uh, even, you know. I mean, we had lots of those things that we did. But you had to know the dividing line between what is funny and what is insulting. So, and luckily, I can't even think of one incident where the line was overstepped, you know. So it was many, many interesting things were done. But it always was new and uh, one of a time. All the work you were doing at that point was very much pioneering and new. You, it was hadn't been done before, and that all of the procedure manuals hadn't been written yet. You know, we are talking about uh, going back to the old days, where everything was new. As a matter of fact, uh, in these days, uh, we used to freely trade between contractors. The one guy says, do you have a sheet of aluminum? I need some of this. And the guy says, yeah, could you have me uh, some fittings of this kind of nature? And uh, yeah, come on over, you can get some of those. And it was rather a great uh, camaraderie between even individual contractors. And uh, like you say, procedures, they were rather small. I remember I made in my documents, I still have the launch count from Shepard, which was about uh, 40, 50 pages. Now, when you compare it with the five volumes right now of a shuttle launch, that's quite a long way in between. We uh, also made many mistakes, you know, that you learn from your mistakes because everything was new. But uh, we survived and we learned from our mistakes. So the main thing was, as a matter of fact, frequently I have been asked, which was the most important launch that, uh, in your activities? And interesting enough, it was not the landing on the moon. But the most important one, the most remarkable one, was Shepard's flight. Because uh, when he went uh, to fly, that was a time when you still saw three or four out of five missiles blow up. And the story was, oh, there goes another nose cone, you know. You build another nose cone and you try again. But all of a sudden you realize, hey, wait a minute, there's a guy in it, somebody you know and everybody else knows, and you can't just say, hey, uh, let it go, you know, we get another one. As a matter of fact, there was a little story, and that was uh, funny. I used to belong to the Presbyterian Church on the beach, and John Glenn was a Presbyterian, and uh, one year, before Glenn was very well known, we had uh, young people uh, staying at the church for two weeks, you know, for a camp type thing, and they asked if we would, uh, you know, give them a speech in the evening. So I asked John, I said, John, you want to come along? We have some young people, you know, last year, high school or first year college, so uh, he says, yes, and uh, the way it turned out, he was a little late. So I said, okay, my friend John, uh, who works for Langley, I mean, at that time, NASA was still at Langley, he'll join me a little bit later, but I didn't tell him the last name. And so then we talked. And uh, then finally John showed up. I introduced him. I said, John, I said, uh, he works for, for NASA at Langley. And we let it go as such. And then I thought, okay, let me see what happened when we uh, get a little bit in the interesting side. So I said, to, I asked the question, I said, you know, the way missiles explode and things like that, what do you think is going to happen, or what should we do if one of the seven doesn't make it back? Well, the kids thought about it a while, and then one boy said, oh, he says, that isn't that bad. I mean, take another one. you got seven of them, don't you? And after he said that, I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, now, let's see how one of them would feel. I said, you know, I've didn't give you the name, but uh, John's last name is Glenn, and I said, he is one of the seven. Why don't you ask him what he thinks about that? And the guy really re recovered fast. He said, oh, oh, where's a hole I can climb into? But uh, we did that frequently, you know, with other words, to go out and interface with young people and so on, and uh, you could get some interesting stories out of it. Now, needless to say is that uh, in between, the paperwork increased tremendously but so did the complexity of the missiles and so on. But uh, I still think, uh, even today, there's too much paperwork. Where in the early days, you had an electrical engineer and he says, okay, go ahead and apply electrical power. And a few minutes later, the guy would come back and say, the electrical power has been applied. Now you go ahead and says, okay, on panel R12, throw a switch XXX to the on position, then go to panel so-and-so, do this and this, and 
It's ridiculous. I mean, we have to assume that the people know what they're doing and let them go ahead with it. So, but that's private opinion again, you know. So, these were, were the so-called old days. But uh, I interfaced with all the astronauts and it was rather interesting. Each one was a individual. They were, none of them were like the others. How would you characterize each of them? No, I mean, they were, if you want to go through the whole list, I mean, they were uh, naturally. Shepard was one of the most technically uh, knowledgeable one. I mean, he was fast on the draw. He could what be called the uh, abort sequence. He could run this thing off in such a fast time that nobody could even follow him. And uh, he was very, very well technically inclined. Gus was a little bit more on the quiet side, you know. And then now Glenn was really the Boy Scout, if you want to call it that way, because uh, he always had in mind, I'm in the limelight and uh, I have to represent the United States no matter what I do. As a matter of fact, one time he, uh, his wife and, and uh, Scott Carpenter was his backup pilot and Scott's mother, we had dinner, I think it was a holiday inn or some restaurant on the beach. And the uh, boy came up with a picture, shoved it in front of Johnny to say, sign this. Now, during dinner, I, w I was tempted to tell him what he could do with the picture, but John just signed the picture and gave it back to him, and the guy didn't even say thank you. So I mentioned to John, I said, you know, I don't think I would have been that tolerant. And he just looked at me and says, hey, that you have to expect that goes with a job. So he was really very quiet on that one. And uh, naturally, Wally, he was the one who was always thinking up ways to enliven the whole team and so on. He was a great practical joker. So same way, I mean, with Gordon Cooper. Gordon and these guys could always come up with something you hadn't seen before. As a matter of fact, at one time, Dee O'Hara, she was the astronaut's nurse, you know, in the crew quarters with Dr. Douglas was the astronaut physician. And uh, she complained that uh, Wally was always slow, uh, not even providing the urine samples she needed to have. So she made that official complaint, and next morning uh, in front of her office there was a five-gallon jug with a greenish-brown liquid in it with foam on top and still uh, warm, you know, and it says Wally's urine sample for one week. So needless to say, I mean, it was always a lot of back and forth. And uh, also these guys used to run the Corvettes, which was pretty neat, except uh, Cooper offered me once a ride from the Mercury from the uh, Atlas pad, and it's a very neat U-turn curve, and I think we, we didn't use more than two wheels to get around it. And I told him, I said, you know, I'd rather fly this thing, I mean, the spacecraft, than drive with you, because that's more dangerous than anything else. But then Cooper was always, uh, he wanted to race cars. He did that until they finally leveled the boom on him and said you couldn't do that anymore. So they were pretty much individuals. <coughs> did Carpenter, he had a Corvette too? Yeah, I mean, they all, see, Jim Rassman used to furnish all of them with Corvettes, and they were always gray at that time. So uh, they frequently got chased by the Cocoa Beach police. <coughs> but uh, that was just, it went with the territory, you know. Mm. So... Did they bring their families with them to Cocoa Beach? No, the families would uh, come uh, pretty much just before lounge or when they were staying here for longer durations, you know, they would come. But other than that, the families were not always here. No, they would more or less come to one or two days and uh, then go back home to Houston, except for lounge, then they would come and show up, you know. Now, it was different when we went into the Apollo program because then we had the four-week quarantine where even people like myself, I was a primary contact, and uh, we were the only ones that could make physical contact with the astronauts. And then the wives would come, and we had a beach house, which is still there on the beach, where they could spend some time together and things like that, because they weren't allowed to leave that. And that's where the fish story comes in. When they weren't allowed to leave, I sometimes would drive up there to the NASA causeway and just pick them up in my boat and we go water skiing or we go fishing and things like that. 
which was legal as long as we didn't make contact with any outside person. <laughs> so it got to be a hassle. I didn't like that primary contact because when you called in and said you had a cold, you had to come in. I mean, they, they swapped your throat and did this and that. Uh, the cure always was just about killing you. But then they wanted to make sure they didn't have any bacteria on the flight crews. So that was... There were only about 70 or 80 people that were, for each flight, were primary contacts. And the families would then sometimes come down and stay a week or two. So you got to know their families? Got to know their families. As a matter of fact, I made it a habit in the Apollo program. I would always give them a tour of the spacecraft, you know, once we were shortly before launch, to see where their husbands would spend the time. And I think it made a great hit with them because they were much more satisfied with uh, seeing the spacecraft, you know, and seeing what goes on. Just like the same thing on the Mercury at one time, Anne Glenn was asking me, could you actually guarantee a safe return of John? I said, uh, Anne, anybody who will guarantee you that is lying because there's nobody who can guarantee a safe return. I said, the only guarantee we can give you is that at the time we launch, that if I know of something which would be detrimental for the flight, I can stop it. But other than that, I could not guarantee a safe return. And they more or less bought into it. On the last tip we talked about, we started talking about the seven astronauts, and there were two mm -hmm. more to talk about. What about Carpenter and Slater? No, Carpenter was actually uh, a quiet one. He was a backup for John Glenn, and uh, we worked with him extensively, and he always looked uh, to me like the fellow who always has bad luck. You know, I mean, he uh, had an accident, and I think he broke his wrist or did something. And, uh, but he was a very, very uh, pleasure to work with. Now, Slayton, uh, especially after he was disqualified, so to speak, you know, because of his heart rumor, and he became the director of the astronaut office, it uh, kind of became known that uh, he was running the show and uh, he could decide who was going to fly next. So he never wanted to cross up uh, good old Deke. But uh, here again, uh, I think he was very, very disappointed, you know, that he couldn't go, and it was until we flew the ASTP that he finally uh, got to go. And I think possibly what the, the uh, medics they uh, did to him was something that they just didn't know enough about that time, you know, because the heart murmur that they were saying later on says, oh, it shouldn't have disqualified him in the first place. But you realize when you put that much of your life into it, it's a great disappointment if somebody says, no, you can't go. So uh, he was, oh, we got a sea call in the canal right now. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, he was uh, pretty much the man who was assigning astronauts and trying to keep him in line and all that jazz. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit a bit about the race for space. Now, the race, as it uh, turned out to be, it really didn't get started until uh, Sputnik was in orbit. And uh, the sad part about it was that it was more or less a political race rather than a technical race. Because way before that, the uh, army team under Van Braun had actually the capability to launch an explorer before Sputnik. But uh, somewhere along the line, it was decided that the Navy, with their Vanguard program, would be the first one to launch a satellite. And only after several failures of the Vanguard was permission given to launch the Explorer 1. Now, this could have been avoided, you know, but again, there was a decision which was not necessarily a technical one. And, uh, but needless to say, everybody jumped down on it and said, okay, we are now in a space race. And the Russian uh, came up as a pretty good show. They always beat us, you know, in man in space, woman in space, or dog in space, and so on. The only thing they couldn't beat us in was going to the moon. So uh, I guess sometimes you get from the technical aspect and to the political aspect, and uh, that's hard for technical people to comprehend because uh, there are too many ramifications in it. 
But we made a big hit in the world with John Glenn's flight because we were so open. See, and we everybody could see it, everybody knew about it, and uh, we didn't hide anything. So that made uh, up for quite a great deal in taking the uh, glamour away from the Russians by showing, okay, we are wide open, you can see our rockets, you can see our astronauts, you can see what we do, we show you when we launch. So that came in pretty handy then. They didn't do that? No, they were still, I mean, extremely uh, secret about all their activities. And as a matter of fact, until the glass knot came about, I mean, they still didn't permit regular visitors to their launch facilities and so on. So. There was the sense, though, that that we might lose the race for through the 60s and... Now, it, it came pretty close uh, because, you know, uh, Kennedy had said in this decade, and we were already in the middle of 69, so uh, there were some, finally some decisions made to go take a step, you know, and uh, one of the big, I guess, all the uh, public successful steps was uh, the Borman flight, you know, when he uh, read from the scripture there, which brought up another interesting little side story that came up, and then was after he read this uh, uh, Japanese reporter here from the motel in Cocoa Beach called NASA and says, you know, uh, I didn't quite get whatever he said. Uh, is there any handout that we can have to uh, uh, get the correct wording? The NASA guy being on a ball, he says, are you in a motel? The guy says, yes, I am. He says, look in your drawer. You find a little red book that says uh, Gideon Bible. He says, yeah, I have it. He says, now look on page so and say on the Genesis. The guy found this body, he said, oh, this is what he said, yes, this is what he said. The guy said, thank you, you NASA folks think of everything. Well, that was one of the little stories, you know, where we ever once in a while get a laugh out of. But uh, uh, true happenings, yeah. There was a German community here in this area. Were you part of that? Now, actually not really a community per se. I mean, there were, Cocoa Beach wasn't that big and Merritt Island wasn't that big, but there were several Germans that uh, originally came down with Van Braun and so on, and then came from Huntsville to here, and they lived in that area. But there wasn't really that great uh, of a uh, community affairs going on, because everybody was really too busy to do things. So uh, there wasn't much what you could call a community per se. Mm -hmm. But everybody knew everybody, that's no question about it. So, but now, quite a large number of them have passed away by now. Yeah. The, um, the program owes a lot to the Germans who came here uh, with von Braun and Kurt Diebus and... Yes, I think there was, uh, they, they contributed quite heavily to it in the development of the rockets because uh, the, uh, uh, Big rockets, you know, the one we use for Apollo, were actually designed by people from the original Von Braun team. And uh, then the uh, spaceport putting it together here was Debus is doing. So yes, there were quite a few uh, contributions that these folks made. And uh, the other thing was that Von Braun had a marvelous way of handling Congress to uh, get money approved for the programs. As a matter of fact, uh, I frequently, when I uh, talk to people, I give them two examples there where the fight started with, uh, for instance, at one time when there were budget hearing for NASA, there was Proxmire who said, uh, we are pursuing a way to go to outer space to see if there's life anywhere in the universe. He says, this is a futile ex uh, attempt because uh, there is none. And the uh, NASA leader of the budget team said, uh, Senator, you also need to consider it. Before 1491, nobody believed there was an America because nobody ever had heard of it, and therefore there was none. And uh, one of my other famous stories from Von Braun, I picked that one up uh, from him himself one time. <clears throat> he went to a budget hearing, and they said, no, you know, in our age of computers, 
we should really eliminate the costly man and space program because we can do everything with computers. And when Braun had a real nice uh, prepared answer for that, he says, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you got to understand the best computer in the world is the human brain. And it's the only piece of, of equipment that can be mass produced by unskilled labor. So here again, he got his uh, money for the program. He had a good, good way of doing it. I think in a way, reflecting for myself, I believe uh, the many, many changes in the leadership that have taken place over the last few years, you know, reflect on it that we don't have as strong a leadership as we had, and that evidently penalizes the program. Because uh, today you can go on the street and say, okay, who is the uh, head of the uh, space station project? And people even living in this community don't know. So it's, uh, it gets into the political end of it, you know, and uh, it's a shame because uh, in my line of thinking, a nation that uh, deletes the research and development programs is a nation that will lose its econom uh, economic standing in the world. I think in a way you can see at Great Britain when they can't, when they became socialistic and everything was state-owned and they cut back on research and development, they no longer became a world power. So I, I'm a strong believer in uh, funding research and development, because this is where our future lies. People talk about spin-offs from space, and I think um, what you're talking about is the greatest spin-off, that just the quest for knowledge and the the, always pushing the limits of what we can do. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, the, the cliche is always, oh yeah, they gave us a Teflon frying pan, which is ridiculous, because the greatest achievements are not just they, I mean, in, in this type of thing, but all the medical things, the miniaturization, your communication equipment, and all these things that, uh, as a matter of fact, our whole computer industry had greatly profited from the research and development. We couldn't have been the number one producer in the world of computers if it hadn't been for the space program. These are the spin-offs, and they said, now why would you send money to the moon? We never sent money to the moon. It always was staying right here on Earth. We never spent it to the, on the moon. So that's the reason I say we need to go ahead and spend monies on uh, uh, projects, and I like to see more Earth-oriented projects that uh, if I would favor a uh, item that could be generated would be if we have a breakthrough that lets us transmit electrical energy without wires. We could really all run electric cars and heat our homes with electricity, no pollution, nothing, if we learn, because there's a lot of electrical power to be had right in the space. And if we learn how to conduct it or how to transport it, without wires, that would be an achievement that would be really a, a jump in mankind. So there are many, many projects that I could think of that uh, could be done, which would benefit mankind tremendously. You mentioned something that that's really has a lot to do with the ecology, uh, trying to mm -hmm. reduce pollution. There's still a lot of wildlife out around the Cape. Did you run into uh, any wild creatures in, in your... Oh, it, it got to be a rather uh, a big nuisance. There are two things. Uh, I came home one night around Pat uh, 3437 and uh, to the right and left of the road were 37 deer. You're standing looking at you and you had to worry about it uh, that uh, they didn't jump across when you were passing them. The other one, when you talk about wildlife, had an interesting thing, and there was, again, there was, as a matter of fact, in the early days of a shuttle program, uh, I was working, uh, I had the safety organization for Rockwell at this time, uh, the operational end of it, and uh, one of our lady inspectors told me that uh, on second shift, when she went to her car in the uh, parking lot, there was a 16-foot alligator between two cars. Needless to say, it uh, kind of upset 
somebody, including myself, and uh, I decreed that as of this afternoon we would have lights in the parking lot, which they said it couldn't be done, but then when I mentioned that uh, if they don't have lights, there will be no workers. So then, uh, surprisingly, by 2 o'clock, there were all kinds of portable lights there because can you imagine walking in a parking lot and meeting a 16-foot alligator? So, yes, there's lots of wildlife out there. As a matter of fact, close to pad A, there is an a, a undercut on the road where you can see the biggest trout you have ever seen in your life. I mean, 10, 12-pound trout just standing there, except you aren't allowed to fish. So, uh, yes, there's lots of wildlife, and uh, it is pretty much, as a matter of fact, they have to get rid of it, transfer some of it out, because you probably read the stories about the wild hogs, you know, that uproot the orange trees and things like that, and uh, one fellow worker that worked with me, uh, he got a brand new car, and two weeks later at night time, he hit one of those hogs, wiping out the whole front end of his car. So there are many, many, many animals. As a matter of fact, what they do is, uh, I think they, they have like a park service there that collects the dead rabbits in the morning and feeds them to the, <laughs> and throws them out for the alligators because they are just laying on the road. They have a rather large number of deer out there. And uh, as I said, it becomes a, a danger to the public because uh, if you drive at night and one jumps in front of you, it comes right through the windshield. You know, there are a lot of birds that come through in the winter. Yeah, there are lots of birds because they got lots of water there, you know, and uh, it's it's an ideal place. Same way with the eagles, you know, that eagle nest there that is on State Road 3, the eagles come back every year. Have you seen them? Oh yeah, I've seen them many times. Yeah, you can see the young ones and later on they just sit on top, you know, and not flying yet. But uh, evidently the, the mother pair comes back and the nest itself is something like several hundred pounds now. They think it may be 400 pounds because they add, every year they add to it. So now there's lots and lots of birds and, uh, but interesting enough, even when you see close to the launch pads, the pelicans and so on, when we launch, they just fly off and come right back. Doesn't bother them a bit. So we were, one, we were worried about it might disturb them. Evidently, they get used to it real quick, like. So, no, there's a lot of wildlife out there. Sometimes they used to, used to call looking for uh, rockets bird watching around here when people didn't know when launches were. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, you just call them, it's a bird, you know, I mean, a rocket too. But uh, at one time, I mean, remember we were the highest in the nation here on Merritt Island that had the largest number of species. It was several, I guess maybe 10 years ago, you know, when they count the birds around December. And I think here on Merritt Island, we had over 220 some odd different species of birds here. It has decreased now because it's much more built up. But uh, there used to be lots of wildlife around here. That's a moment, like I mentioned just uh, when I was looking and talking to you about the manatees swimming in the canal. <laughs> it's, it's interesting to see the, the old and the new together out there. I guess when you first came here, the the Cape had some houses on it. Oh yeah, there were quite a few houses at the Cape, and then also where the, the Kennedy Space Center is, you know, I mean the whole area where the launch pads are, there were lots of houses, there was a whole subdivision. And they moved all the houses, I mean some of them they kept for a while, you know, as storage space, and then they moved them all except that beach house. The beach house is the only one that's still standing there that's being used, as a matter of fact. It's still being used. Oh yeah, still being used. As a matter of fact, they have a conference room there and sometimes before flight, you know, the crews get together and uh, have a small conference talking about what goes on. So that beach house is still there. There's a refrigerator, microwave oven, and you can have some food there, whatever you need. Okay, okay. You have another question you might want to ask? <laughs> yeah. well, I'm interested in asking you about mosquitoes. Now mosquitoes, uh, at that time, they were a little bit on the heavy side. As a matter of fact, we used to get uh, the spray plane over here and the uh, trucks that do the fogging, which helped a great deal, but then uh, just as self-defense, a lot of the individual homeowners, we had little gadgets you put on the muffler of your lawnmower, and at the airport you could get for free 
the uh, material that you run through the uh, lawnmower muffler, which made a heck of a big cloud, and you could get rid of some of the mosquitoes. <coughs> but uh, it was rather interesting, also at the Cape. I mean, at night time, there was no way you could be outside without uh, mosquito spray. Plus, the other fact was, I remember in the very early days uh, in Hangar S, where we uh, were first working with the Mercury spacecraft, they had these trenches where they had the electrical cable in it. And the standard work was, if you pull on a cable and it pulls back, leave it go, it is a snake. Because there used to be quite a few black snakes in the cable trays, and uh, if you pulled on one, you rather put it back real quick like. Plus rattlesnakes. I mean, now rattlesnakes you have out there too, in, in quite a large number of things. So, uh, <laughs> yes, you had lots of natural wildlife out there. And mosquitoes were not the ones you really wanted to have, because it got to a point where in the evening you really had to juice yourself up with mosquito repellent just to, to make it. Which didn't do too well, because heat, humidity, and that spray on you, that was kind of... Uh, not too pleasant, but that's all you had. I mean, you couldn't do much about it. Did the mosquitoes <coughs> ever get into the machinery? I guess this was not a big thing. No, mosquitoes didn't bother us too much, but we had rabbits and uh, other animals that would eat the insulation of the cables in the wire trays, and frequently we would miss uh, electrical signals and find out that either the rabbits or some other creatures uh, had eaten through the insulation on the cables. That was not too unfrequent out there. You had to worry about this. In the, uh, in the spacecraft itself, we didn't have too much to worry about. One time we did have some ants in a Germany spacecraft. Somewhere along the line they got in and we had to actually bait them to get out of them because uh, the last thing you want to have is have a couple of ants keeping you company there at night in a spacecraft. 100 60 miles up in space. So uh, that wasn't too bad. No, the other one was that uh, in uh, on pad 19, we had a red owl that uh, took up uh, residence way up high and uh, would provide us with some drippings and some leftover bones and things like that, which we didn't appreciate. So, but then again, I mean, it's their territory. <laughs> As well as the wildlife, you had to contend with the weather. And there's quite often storms and a lightning out of... Yes, no, you just, these are all things that are given, and you just have to make the best you can. As a matter of fact, when you talk about wildlife in one before the Mercury program, I was here on another program where we had a little solid rocket, and every night at 5 o'clock we would get a family of skunks come in and eat all the bugs that had fallen down from the electric lights, you know, during the night. And whenever they moved in, we moved out, because it only took them 10 minutes, except one time there was a Air Force colonel in there, and he was trying to see how secure we were, and he snuck in, and he met the skunk. Needless to say, they wouldn't let him get his car to go back to Patrick, they put him in the back of a pickup truck. But this is all natural wildlife, so... You take it as it comes along. You mentioned one other thing about the social life here. You know, we had some uh, uh, very good German restaurant here, and uh, that led up to another old Mercury story <coughs> during the Atlas program. At that time, Scott, you need to understand, in, in uh, Project Mercury, the astronauts were on 5 PSI, 100% oxygen, air, so to speak, okay? And uh, it was a closed-loop system. In other words, uh, air was always be regenerated, some oxygen added to it, and some uh, CO2 absorbed by a CO2 absorber, but not much else. It wasn't very highly sophisticated. So one time during a test, uh, when you listen to the headset, the next thing you heard, the noise like, oh, oh, everybody kind of set up, they didn't know where it was coming from. You have another one like that, oh, and uh, after it occurred the third time, they, I guess by that time, the doctors in the blockhouse just stood on their chairs and they said, Scott, what's wrong? What's wrong? Do you have a problem? We have to terminate the test. 
He says, no, he says, but that's the last time I'm going to go to that German uh, restaurant and have beer, sauerkraut and beans. So uh, needless to explain as to what happened inside his suit. There was a, a couple of years, I think they did a, a kind of an Oktoberfest in Cocoa Beach. I don't know if you Oh, remember. at one time, yes, there was an individual who actually would roast uh, uh, half a whole still on a spit, you know, and uh, they really had a big one going. It was actually a German restaurant, and uh, this guy, uh, he put up a big tent, you know, and brought all the things in, and he actually roasted a whole steel, a steel on it, you know. So uh, it, was, it was a pretty good imported beer and all this jazz. Yeah, they had some good things going. But uh, later on, I think he elaborated too much, and uh, I think eventually even broke on it. Because, you know, when you have a good thing going, you got to know when to stop. And I guess he just enlarged, enlarged, enlarged until it got too big. But uh, the other thing socially what we did too is uh, after each flight I would arrange for the launch crews and their wives to have a party where the flight crew would come in and tell us what really happened on the flight. So we would have a dinner, you know, at one of the restaurants where we had actually guards guarding the entrances to keep newspaper and other people out of it because that was the only way we could have them really telling us what was happening on the flight. And needless to say, nobody ever reversed to the press what was said. It was pretty neat and was a good morale booster too. So, uh, because, you know, when you have that much free time donated to you, you have to give something back to the people too, and that was one way to do that, to reward them, you know, for all their efforts. Well, right after a launch, uh, everybody would be up and often go somewhere, I guess. Oh, yeah, we had big parties and uh, sometimes got out of hand. People were thrown in pools and things like that. Yes, we, were, we had some real dandy lounge parties after that. They were great. As a matter of fact, for Glenn's flight, there was a bakery here and he had made a four foot tall Mercury spacecraft out of uh, cake, except we scrubbed about five four or five times and that, that cake got pretty old after a while but uh, just one of those things you know we never knew when we were launching so that that was one of those things but we did have nice launch parties here yes where would you go what places well normally we, we would pick a motel that uh, had a swimming pool and so on and we would have it outside you know to accommodate all the people as a matter of fact what would happen is most of the contractors, like General Dynamic for the Atlas, you know, or uh, Martin Marietta for the uh, uh, Gemini, they would, each contractor would have their own parties and you would go from one party to another. And for the parties I mentioned, when we had dinner parties, we had them, let's say, at the Cape Colony Inn, which is now a different name. Wherever there was a, a place sufficient to entertain about 300 people, as a matter of fact, on the last Gemini flight, where I got this one check, you see there, the one for one million Deutsche Marks for unemployment compensation, uh, courtesy of uh, Lovell, and uh, uh, who was the other one? Aldrin. And uh, when we had that party, at the end, after they gave us their story about what happened on the flight, a couple of deputy sheriffs arrested him. And uh, after everything was silent, they wonder what happened. Why would they be arrested, you know? And then the deputy sheriffs let them know there was an individual who claimed to have passed a worthless check. In the back of us, I was my big check. I said, I'd like to cash it now. So these were the little things we used to do to liven up our daily life. Uh, one of the things that happened to me, you see the little big check I got here. And the reason I got it is since I was spacecraft oriented, that means I was taking care of the spacecraft. Mercury and Gemini were built by McDonald Aircraft in St. Louis. The next program, Apollo, was built by North American. So they told me that I would now be out of a job and to tie me over, they handed me a check made out to myself for one million Deutsche Marks drawn on the bank of uh, Lowell and Aldrin. 
And you'll notice one thing is here, the day changed because November 9, November 10, November 11, because twice we scrubbed before they actually went. So see this nice little check was handed to me and uh, I had it. Then except after the flight, when the crew came back to uh, tell us what happened on the flight and we had a dinner with all the families of the launch crews at the, now the skating ring here on Merritt Island. After they delivered their speech, uh, two deputies arrested them. And uh, after everybody was aghast and wanted to know what really happened to them, then the deputies explained to him that uh, they were arrested because they were passing a worthless check. So in the background, then I held up my check. I said, I'd like to have my check cashed at this time. So that's the reason you have one of those things again, you know, a check and I still keep it as a souvenir. What are these other numbers in the corners? Do they relate to now, the they actually, yes, these actually Gemini launch vehicles, serial number 62. See, these were the, actually the ones that, that were, and these were the spacecraft 12, the of, of re official drawing number was 52-3100. So they used all these numbers in uh, one way or another. So it's, it's a nice souvenir to have. Okay, now what you're seeing here is uh, a trophy trout. Now the story on this one is rather interesting because during the Apollo days, the crews were quarantined for about uh, one month prior to the flight and only a limited number of persons were permitted to make physical contact with them called primary contacts. So since they were confined to crew quarters, they couldn't leave KSC unless under very strict circumstances. Uh, what we could do is I was permitted to drive with my boat all the way up to the NASA Causeway and we would go and go fishing and catch fish. Now, also they knew that I used to catch quite a few fish and having been in my home, they always would tease me by not having a great mounted fish on the back of the living room wall. I said, I don't need that. And uh, they said, oh yes, you, you definitely should have a trout, I mean, or you should have a trophy on your wall. On the most important flight, the actually lunar landing, I was uh, up in my normal station at the White Room, 365 feet above sea level, and uh, the flight crew showed up, and after a while I could smell something like what smelled like fish. Now that was very strange to me because why would it smell like fish at 365 feet up? If there was a dead fish on the beach, there was one thing, but why would it smell up there? I thought nothing of it and uh, we exchanged little presents with uh, Aldrin and with uh, uh, Armstrong. And the last one to get in was uh, Mike Collins. Now when his turn came, he reached behind him and he had a brown paper bag in my nice clean white room, which was illegal to begin with. And out came this trout, mounted like that, as a trophy trout. He says, now you have a trout for your wall. And uh, he said, I hope you will display it. There were only three things wrong with it. To begin with, it is only eight inches long, which is illegal size. Secondly, it wasn't cleaned. And thirdly, it wasn't preserved. The only thing it was, it came right out of a deep freeze. Later I found out that the fish and wildlife people actually got him that trout the night before and they just uh, put it up on the board and I believe uh, Joe Schmidt, the suit technician, has hand in it and they just nailed it on the board, put it in a freezer and then took it out to present to me. Now what do you do with a trout like that? You can't hang it on the wall. So I wrapped it up and put it in the freezer where it stayed for about 22 years because I couldn't get anybody to touch it, uh, to preserve it. Finally, I found uh, a company in St. Petersburg that was freeze-drying pets, and I asked them if they want to have a crack at it, and they said they would try it. So then they managed in three and a half months to freeze-dry it, and now I can hang it up on the wall. So when we had the reunion here at the 20th anniversary of the lunar landing, uh, I invited the flight crew again, you know, I said, hey folks, I said, uh, how about a nice dinner at my house? They said, what are you serving? I said, how about a fish dinner? And Collins jumped in and says, no, thank you. I don't think I care much 
for a fish dinner because I believe you still have a trout that I don't care for. So I said, yes, that's the one I was going to serve you. So I showed him what I really had. But these are the little things that uh, we used to do uh, to each other, you know, to uh, play. And that meant actually they were what we call inside stories. You see, if they out that people wouldn't know why it happened or what really came about it. So that much is the fish story. Now, one other story I need to, I need to tell you about is because I'm very proud of it, and that is uh, after the Challenger accident we had, it was decided to uh, create a memorial for the astronauts. But then I also realized over the years there were about seven people that we had killed on the pad, technicians strictly in the line of duty. And I approached the Astronaut uh, Memorial Commission. I said, uh, how about putting their names on the memorial, which was turned down. So then I asked uh, if we could have another memorial for them. And again, it was turned down. And by that time, I was advised, while well, I still was working there, that the center didn't want it, and I should not pursue it anymore. So uh, when I retired, and I was now in a position that nobody could fire me, I started to pursue my quest for a astronaut memorial, uh, except it would be for the technicians. And uh, one month before the big astronaut memorial was dedicated, there was a dedication ceremony, you have the one picture there, where we dedicated a memorial to the people that lost their life in the line of duty and they were not astronauts. But I could not see a differentiation between the life of one or the other. So that's the reason I worked so hard for it. And what I did is I got all my old friends, astronauts and so on, engaged in writing letters and calling the center director, the head of NASA and everybody else to go ahead and get permission to have it done. So finally we did get it done. And we dedicated that one one month before the major one. And as a matter of fact, we had some of the family members of the people we killed there. So that was one item that I uh, uh, was very, very pleased to have accomplished because uh, it meant a lot to me. Okay, you now actually you can see that the center director, General McCartney, and myself, on the day we dedicated the memorial for the people that lost their life in the line of duty at the Space Center. This memorial right now is uh, located between the IMAX and the other theater inside. And as you can see, it's a nice gadget. Very nice, Emma. So I'm very proud of having got this one done. It's a dangerous business. It is. And uh, it is never something that you can assume nothing will happen. There are lots of things you play with explosives, with high-pressure gases, with uh, poisonous propellants and things like that. The worst thing that can happen to you is if you get complacent and you think you know all the answers, that's when it's going to come and get you. So uh, it's not a routine business that uh, you would say like a railroad station or an airport or things like that because it can never be like an airport because each flight is different. Each flight has a different crew, each flight has a different payload and probably a different mission. So this will never be just a routine thing. Okay, here you actually get a handle as to an idea as to what it looked like on an Apollo launch. Many, many hours prior to the actual launch, you see the street blocked up by uh, with cars and uh, vans and so on that want to see the launch. So that would be the time, uh, several hours before launch, when I go in and I took these pictures, you know, of us driving into the Cape to get to work. So here you see the old South Gate. And uh, for many people it became actually a, uh, uh, like a picnic affair that they would bring all their goodies there and spend the night there and just watch for the lounge. There's the old sign of the Air Force Station. What you see in the background, as a matter of fact, is uh, one of the blimps that was used to uh, uh, 
watch the drug trafficker and things like that. He has an overview of the lounge area. As you can tell, that is a somewhat of an old video camera, and actually it was a movie camera that did that, and it got transferred to a video. In the background, you see now an Apollo launch vehicle, and uh, here is, we are coming out. The area is already cleared of all personnel, because you can see the uh, oxygen vapors coming off the launch vehicle itself, and uh, we are on our way out to go ahead. We are driving out to... Uh, prepare the spacecraft for the crew arrival. I believe a little bit later you will see from the top actually the astronaut van coming out to bring us the flight crew. <coughs> this was neat uh, for me to drive through the gate without having to show a badge because at that time we didn't have any guards or anybody else there stopping us. So it was always nice that we could do whatever we wanted to do because there was nobody else around except we had to be a little bit careful of uh, TV cameras following us or watching us because you never know what would show up later on. Now here you see actually the ice formation on the rocket and what you're seeing coming off is actually oxygen vapors. Now uh, then ever once in a while big sheets of ice would uh, come down. Okay, let me stop it a second here. One of, one of those days I took a sentimental trip through the Cape and by the way the flag you see blowing in the breeze there at the South Gate is something that I put there when the Air Force said it couldn't be had and I helped them out to get a flagpole there. And uh, here we are at Complex 14 where it shows all the flights that went out on Mercury Atlas flights. And uh, next to it is the uh, uh, memorial, I mean not a memorial, actually the whatever you want to call it, for the seven astronauts. So this uh, pad 14 in the background. I wanted to take all these pictures before the gantries and the uh, things disappeared because eventually they rusted out. Here is complex 19, the Gemini complex, where we launched all these birds from one complex. And uh, it was a rather interesting time there because they were coming in very, very short order. There is the old structure with the main structure laying down and the blockhouse on the left hand side. This was the launch configuration. Now today all this stuff has been uh, removed because uh, the same way this is the old Apollo launch pad, the originally one for the uh, uh, early models of the Apollo. This is also the place where we had the fire. <coughs> And here we're taking a little trip through the Space Museum, which uh, is open to the public on Sundays, but that's the only time it's open. And I took a quick trip there to keep on film what was there or what is there for the next generation to look at it. Here is the old Redstone gantry with uh, a Redstone missile in it. As you can tell, it's a long way from what we have today this climate controlled white rooms and everything like that. We had an old rickety elevator going up and down the side of the structure which was hair raising to do to begin with whenever it was working. Some of the old rockets that used to be there's the Polaris in the center, a bow mark and so and there's an atlas laying down. That is a famous red bird, snark that used to land frequently right off the beach, where they used to call it the uh, snark infested waters because some of them just bellied right in. It's an old nose cone with a beryllium heat shield to survive the uh, re-entry. There's a Titan rocket two stage. That was the same that uh, we used for the Gemini program. Now you got to look at the plumbing, the plumbing, plumber's nightmare, right? These are the engines. And by the way, this is strictly a hypergolic rocket. I mean, there's hypergolic fuels in it.
I got a lot of footage on that one. <laughs> Here we go, that was, uh, what was that one, was that another? Yeah, I think that was a Navajo, yeah, that uh, eventually was redoubted to never go. <laughs> and an upper stage shown here. I think that one, uh, there's an old German V1. These were the little bus bombs that they used to uh, send over to England and so on, and they captured one of them. Pretty good shape yet. It shows the, interesting enough, this is a pulse jet, and when we go to the uh, new airplanes, we eventually will probably wind up with pulse jets again. So, full circle, it goes around and comes around. There's the Atlas. That's a Minuteman, <coughs> one of the earlier models. <coughs> it's a little AOB, I believe. Oh no, this is, let's stop a minute, uh, because this is of a, of a commercial type t uh, film. You want to stop it? Yes, let me go fast forward on it. It's coming up here. Well, yeah. There. See, this is the old Pad 34, where we uh, actually had the Apollo fire, where we lost Grissom, White and Young. So, the white hump on the right side is a blockhouse, but uh, again, this structure by now has been... Uh, completely levered in the pad, it looked like a little wasteland of nothing. And uh, these were the, uh, the so-called S4Bs that we launched from there, you know, in the early stage of the Apollo program. <coughs> there you see a launch from... Let me see what that one is. Hard to tell from that film if the S4B and S uh, or the uh, big one. It's an Apollo. It's an Apollo, yeah, but I'm not sure if it's uh, the Saturn V or it's the S4B, the the uh, the uh, Saturn One. It was one, and then the S4B, and then. As the five. he used the ones, uh, uh, the very first man uh, uh, Apollo flight after the fire was the one with uh, Cunningham, uh, Chirard, and Isley, and that was on an uh, uh, on the smaller rocket. See, and then after that, we also launched the uh, the lamp from the small rocket from Pad 37. But then we went to the big ones. When we speed it up somewhat. Well, you know, what we haven't said is, is uh, who shot this? Oh, I shot all those films, yeah. How are you allowed to take a camera on the base? Oh, no, uh, if you stayed, you were allowed on launch days to, to uh, take it on the base, you know, uh, up to the visitor area. And uh, uh, that's, this is actually taken from where you could take pictures. The other ones, uh, uh, the one you saw close up and so on, there were, I carried the cameras for astronauts' use. <laughs> that way they could take, I uh, had all those 35 millimeter cameras. If they saw something they wanted to put on a uh, film and not be bothered, you know, with, couldn't take it along and so on. So then they could use my camera and I furnished them the film later on. It's a wonderful memento. I don't think there's anything else like it in the world. Yeah, it's, uh, whenever you go back, you know, it's something that, uh, Sometimes hard to believe that it all happened. See the old contrails there. And the old dirt on the film. <laughs> yeah.
These were the days of the 8 millimeter movie cameras. There was a night lounge here. I think that one lights up the, the neighborhood pretty nice. That was 17? Uh, I'm not sure which one it is, but uh, I think it could be uh, Sonnen's Flight 17, yeah. Because this is Saturn V. And this is from the astronaut's camera. This is from the camera the astronauts bought, yeah, to take these uh, pictures. You see, on my crew, I always had one backup astronaut. So, one that didn't fly. Otherwise, see, we were out there before the flight crews got there, and these pictures were taken beforehand. So uh, the astronaut and my closeout crew, what we call the closeout crew, he was then able to take these pictures for his own home use. See, this is taken now from the general viewing area. Did you take these uh, films back to Germany with you to show them? Uh, I don't know. I probably showed some of, took some of the films back to Germany to show them over there, yeah. But it's hard to do because their projectors run on 50 cycles, we are running on 60 cycles and so on. And see, our video doesn't play over there either because they got a different system. This is Yeah, they did a good job of transferring it from the old video film over to the videotape, uh, from the movie film. Did you breathe a sigh of relief as the... No, they were like, they were stages, with other words, I mean, once it cleared the tower, you know, then you know it's a little bit safer. And then once they uh, were up the first stage burnout, then you know they could always make it back, you know. So it, there were stages, and the same way once they were in orbit, then you didn't worry much about it until they came back and you saw the three parachutes. So that was another one of those things you wanted to see. The most of these are morning shots, you know, when I have to get up early <laughs> to get out there. This is the street you live on, right? Right, yeah. See, that's, I had a little old Volkswagen. I just put the camera in the window and shot these pictures going out early in the morning to uh, be ready for them. There's no one else on the road here. No. It could be that these were taken at one of the, uh, what we call the uh, dry runs or things like that. Yeah, that, that's it's just showing, you know, how to get there. See, I'm on the Cape now, and there's the old uh, Pad 34. <coughs> yeah, that's still 34. No, that, that's uh, <coughs> the miss right now. Okay, that's the other one. That's Pad 5, Pad uh, 7 5 again. <coughs> one time I let the astronaut drive it, and think that it is, I don't know, you can't see it, but that son of a gun was going about 90 miles an hour. I said, damn it, I said, Driving with, look at it, how we went through the gate. Yeah, watch it. I think when we come up through the gate. Here comes the gate, see it? <laughs> Man, he was, he was driving all right, and I was hanging on for dear life there. So, see, so we made a left turn across the gravel, and I think we slid halfway across that one. See? <laughs> he was excited that day. No, I mean, they always drive fast, let's face it. Which yeah. astronaut was driving, you recall? I hate to say this because he is still pretty active in the program. <laughs> I better not I better not give him a black eye because I know who that was. But it was it was fun at that time. This is Apollo eleven, isn't it, this footage? Uh I don't know if this is eleven or not. I don't think this is eleven because uh Eleven, we didn't do much of that uh, picture taking and so on because it was just too critical. See, we only had 90 seconds once the crew got there before we put the crew in. So if we didn't blow the time on any kind of delays, then we had 90 seconds. But this is, I see, that's actually as a backup pilot. He had just put the chlorine injection into the drinking water system. And uh, 
See, these are some of our little presents we had. And for instance, I mean, the one crew member, he was bugging everybody for getting tickets for the VIP site. And uh, this one was the, uh, I'm not sure which one it was, that uh, his wife was expecting a baby, so we gave him that doll to practice uh, diapering a baby. Uh, see, these are our inside little jokes that, that we used to make. So, there we are checking the, that's Grissom. That guy passed away too. He's checking the O2 contents on the crew cabin. The pressure in it. I believe the one you see in there is Krippen. Um, he, because he was my backup pilot several times. Now he says... Yeah, like that's Krippen. That's Krippen. Yeah, I see he's a center director now. <laughs> Boy, it's getting hot in here. <laughs> That's one of the suit technicians. See, what's burning there is the uh, hydrogen gas that uh, is vented out. So we have to, it's highly flammable. So we were burning it in the burn pond. And our worry was that we had a hydrogen leak and, uh, you know, hydrogen is explosive from 3% to 97% so that we just got blown out of, you know what. Okay, now see, when we opened the white room, we had a picture like that. No, this is not it. That's, that's from the struck. Since this is a new tape, you should probably okay. tell us who shot we, this. Oh, no, yes, this is, uh, again, we are on the pad itself. And uh, one of the members of my close-out crew was taking these pictures. And what you see here is that the white room was actually opened up. And uh, there's wide open spaces. Now you have to watch your first step because the step isn't bad, but the landing is 365 feet below. Here you're looking down on the bird again. Lots of ice formation on it. The oxygen vending off. And these pictures were taken from the structure itself. Here we go, that's just prior to uh, the uh, closeout crew leaving the pad. And uh, having closed up everything, just taking a last view around. And uh, showing the slide wire where in case uh, something would go wrong. Oh, I think I went a little bit ahead of myself because I believe this is a sequence where the astronaut man comes up and brings the flight crew out. Yes, here you can see it. There's the astronaut van bringing the flight crew out. So we had a little bit time in between where the backup astronaut could take some pictures. So here we have the little van coming out with the doctor and... Uh, the flight attendant in there, the suit technicians in there, and then only the two techs and the astronauts would come up, and then the rest of the people would leave the pad. So as you can see around the launch pad, there's lots of water. Ideal fishing ground, except nobody's allowed to go and fish. But maybe that helps us out in the long run. It's a good area for fish hatcheries and for renewal of our natural resources. So this is the view from the rocket? That's the view actually you have from the rocket, yeah, from right from the launch tower itself. So and there you see the hatch has been closed. See, they only they have a window there. And uh, see all the side panels have been removed. So we are ready to clear the area. One last look in the window. And uh, I always used to tell him that uh, the next one looking in the window better be a frogman or you're in trouble. So here we are at the foot of the gantry, just loading up our equipment and uh, ready to go back. See, the rocket could be armed once we pass the roadblock 11, uh, or roadblock 5 for that matter. 
then they could arm the rocket. And because there's an escape rocket on top, if something should start below, they could take the capsule away with the escape rocket. But we made sure they don't have that thing armed while we are still around. Wind must be going pretty good. <coughs> there, see, that's part of the suit technicians with all their gear loading up in their station wagon. Oh, I think we got somebody who took an illegal picture, not me. And here we are going back. That's now actually uh, time biases. Uh, we had to pass a roadblock at T minus 55 minutes. Other than that, they would have to delay somewhat. But we, we never delayed a rocket launch. We never had a problem that was blamed on our crew, and we never delayed a rocket launch. So this is the view from the the roadside there. Uh, this is actually is a view that might be another film that I took. Oh yeah, see, there's a motley crew there, <laughs> the close out crew that we had there. And uh, at that time, we created the thing of having flame-proof coveralls, which are now being used by race drivers. We actually originated them by using Nomex. We had we worked with Dupont because we were a little bit worried about uh, catching fire or things like that. Well, this is all the way from the far back area, and it always takes a little while for the thing to get off because. Uh, the uh, ignition of the main engines was uh, 7.6 seconds before liftoff. As a matter of fact, the rocket had to burn off fuel because it was so heavy it wouldn't get off. See, then it took 10 seconds to uh, clear the tower. Once you cleared the tower, you were a little bit easier. Because see, if something goes wrong now, they could eject with the uh, capsule itself and the escape rocket. The first contrail you're probably going to see is doing the area of maximum dynamic pressure, what we call max Q. <coughs> there it goes. See the thing we were waiting for then was at uh, two minutes and twelve seconds or they're about to have the uh, actually the first stage drop off. Okay, there we got another interesting thing there. I think probably misses one to answer that one. There you see the stage. Yes, get that okay. okay. 